Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, uh, Wolfgang Maas. So, um, Wolfgang did his uh, PhD and his habilitation in 74 and 78, respectively, um, in maths, uh, very dear to me, um, at the Ludwig uh, Maximilians Institute for University in Munich. He then went to MIT, the University of Chicago, and UC Berkeley, where I did my fellowship too. Um, he was then uh, associate professor and later professor of computer science at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Um, and since uh, 91, he's been professor of computer science at um, Graz University of Technology in Austria. Um, and he's going to uh, tell us about local prediction learning in high dimensional spaces, which enables uh, neural networks to learn. Over to you. Thank you very much, Stan. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's a real pleasure to be at a meeting which is organized by young scientists who see the need of putting different disciplines together in order to uh, solve you know, big open problems. Now, thank you very much. So, um, I want to start with giving credit you now to the people who did the main work. Maybe actually, Christoph Stöckel is here. Maybe you can briefly stand up. Uh, he also has a poster. And also, in principle, I think the first you know, kind of uh, paper in the direction of this research that I want to sketch just appeared you now a month ago, uh, and so you can look it up then. So, in case you don't want to listen to the whole talk, you now they already hear the take-home messages. Uh, the first one, trying to a little bit stir unrest, uh, reinforcement learning is not the only mathematical framework for thinking about goal-directed behavior. Uh, and we can learn from brains. You now, brains do employ additional tools for that. You know, they have sophisticated internal representations of states and actions and their relations, importantly. Um, and they kind of fall under this you know, somewhat fuzzy term of cognitive maps, typically. But no, we hypothesize that these data structures in the brain are actually very important for planning for fast decision making. And I think this may also be complementary to the approach in reinforcement learning where there is a lot of sophistication, but usually there's not so much sophistication in how you rep represent states. You now, often these are just labels, indices, then, right? And the relations between them are described by probability tables. Uh, we don't believe that this may be the way how the brains, brains do this, and you know, this could be a possible alternative. But apart from this brain speculation, it simply turns out you know, that this approach provides new algorithmic methods for online uh, planning. Uh, that have some niche even now in neuromorphic applications. So overall, you know, the challenge from the perspective of the brain, as we all know, are very good at flexible planning and problem solving, right? If somebody tells you, well, you can't do this, you have to do something else today, you more or less immediately come up with a plan then, right? You don't have to learn a new value function and do policy iteration then. Um, there's actually a very nice review from the perspective of you know, results from experimental and theoretical neuroscience in this review paper by Mata and Lengvill uh, that I can recommend, especially you know, since they argue it's still pretty much open how brands plan then, so there is you know, something to work on for us. So, <clears throat> concerning cognitive maps, um, so on an abstract algorithmic level, no, one can view them simply as data structures that encode relations between items. And they do this apparently in a way where the geometry matters. Geometry not in 2D, but in high dimensional spaces. And I typically think of these high dimensional spaces simply if you have a giant vector which has as many components as the neurons in the brain, so each, you know, the activity of each neuron is kind of one value of this giant vector then. And uh, so we mostly actually, you know, in the experimental literature, uh, we have seen 2D projections of 
these types of cognitive maps. I personally don't think that there's a real reason why they have to be low dimensional. I think they can just as well be 7 or 17 or 700 dimensional. Um, and I think it's more convenient when you write a paper, you rather want to have a 2D map you want to show than. Um, and I, I think it's, it's, I don't see any fundamental limitations, but I'm certainly a layman you know, in this part of cognitive science then. So, as you know, these cognitive maps, you know, they emerged you know, from these results about place cells, uh, where e a sample of neurons you know, fires when the rodent is at a particular location in a 2D environment. But then it was really exciting, you know, both from the lab of Tim Behrens and uh, from Christian Deller in Berlin. They have published data, you know, like this review paper from the Deller lab, where they then you know, induced in human subjects no cognitive maps which have nothing to do with spatial variables. So in this paradigm, uh, the, the subjects you know, learned about cars and their relations, and there are two axes. You know, the x-axis is the machine power, um, and the uh, y-axis are weights then. So none of these are spatial, right? So for example, a Formula One racing car is you now very far out here. It doesn't weigh much, but is you now has a strong motor engine um, and so on. And then uh, in this experiments, you know, they uh, now kind of played games, or the sub subjects had to play games where they moved from one car to another, so they became aware of these two variables which define these coordinate systems. And, and this is really important from just viewing passively uh, these different cars, you, know, you don't get a cognitive map. It's only through playing with them, doing action, well, being active also with these items or concepts, then these cognitive maps emerge then. Um, and so you now there's a wonderful uh, review paper also, you know, James Biddington has now uh, worked on this, you know, what is a cognitive map you now a few years ago then. So we look at cognitive maps um, in a little bit different way than in most of this beautiful work on cognitive maps so far. Uh, we simply look at it from the perspective of an algorithm designer um, who wants to ask, you know, what is the benefit of using cognitive maps then? Um, and uh, we, so far we only used a ways of generating cognitive maps in a very simple way then. Uh, namely in a self-supervised manner through simple local rules for synaptic plasticity. <coughs> so, so far we didn't see any need for DNN or LLM in all of this work then. So, one couldn't ask a question what additional functionality uh, these big tools could provide then. Um, and so, this algorithmic paradigm that I discussed now we call now cognitive map learner, CML. Um, and uh, we tested it on a variety of problems, and I will discuss three problem demands in this talk. First, in abstract spaces for problem solving, then for navigation in 2D physical environments, and finally for complex motor control tasks. Then. Um, so, this is the main architecture uh, for how we think about learning a cognitive map that facilitates planning. So you see on the left you now you have observations which can be you no know, sensor inputs but can also you now encode uh, the state of the plant of the body, uh, whatever else is relevant. And uh, these observations are embedded into a high dimensional sp space. We could call it you known internal state space. But importantly all actions are also embedded separately into the same space. So after all, you have then representation of this heterogeneous types of tokens or embeddings you now in the same space. Then this is essential for our algorithmic approach then. Um, and uh, then the, the main driving principle we use for generating uh, these embeddings Q and V then uh, is a simple uh, kind of prediction learning then, which is now highlighted here in what we call principle one then. So this linear embeddings Q and V are optimized so that the embedding of the observation at the next time step Q of OT plus one 
is no approximate, can be approximated quite well simply by the vector sum of the embedding of the current observation and the current action then. I should now on the side mention, we found then also that this is actually not the only principle for generating cognitive maps, it's just no, a convenient one. And so we're just at the beginning of exploring this different way of building cognitive maps. Then uh, there are certain conditions that these cognitive maps need to satisfy to, in order to be useful for planning. And I hope no, uh, I get to discussing them. So they also know on the side now in this new kind of no, game of algorithm design, there are some uh, decisions that you have to make. You know, what is the dimension of the state space that you choose here? So, so far we use you know, typically 1,000 here. Um, it doesn't matter a lot then, but we do use you know, mathematical properties of vectors in high dimension spaces, which don't occur in low dimension spaces then. Um, and in particular, and I think this property everybody knows, when your random vectors in high dimension spaces tend to be orthogonal each to each other then. Um, and um, also you know, we start out you know, even with you know, embeddings of vectors at the beginning. You know, these are all vectors which have about the same length. Um, and then when we massage then you know, through learning this obs these two embeddings Q and V, they still remain almost you know, have the unit length. Then. So this is also something which uh, is a kind of benefit of high dimension spaces. <coughs> so we don't need any normalization or so on this you know, results of these embeddings then. Um, so as I indicated, you know, we initialize Q and V you know, as you know, to be in initially kind of you know, the map concrete observations or actions onto random vectors. So you simply in in initialize them as random matrices. But there's also you know, some subtle details which I don't want to go a lot into, is how you represent actually observations or actions before you embed them. Uh, I will come to this in one uh, example. The simplest one is you simply you know, use a one-hot vector for every observation or for any action then. Um, and, but there is also you know, one issue we will see later you know, with regard to generalization, whether you choose no, for a particular action, like no, taking one step north, you choose a different code before embedding independently of the location where you currently are, or you use the same everywhere then. So let me first now uh, demonstrate the, the principles of this approach on, on abstract graphs. And uh, when one opens a book on AI, you know, like this you know, standard textbook of Russell and Norvig, when they introduce you no know, planning challenge in AI, they typically describe this as you know, you're given a graph then, and now you're supposed to plan shortest path, say from this node to this node then, um, which is you know, non-trivial then, and definitely not also for a you know, small shallow neural network. Um, but but this is you know, the way how it's formalized then, and I will use you now as a running example for this no, first part of the slides, simply a randomly connected graph with 32 nodes, then it's not planar. Uh, and when you, if this would be the representation in the brain and you're told to move from here to there, no, you probably wouldn't have a clue how to do this then. But generally, no, all the nodes of a graph represent observations or states, no, as we call them after the embedding, and the edges represent possible actions then. So on the right hand side you see <coughs> kind of another you know, some about the structure of the cognitive map after we applied this principle one. So after you now we applied this learning principles for Q and V then. So if you take a closer look, it's not a planar graph. I count actually four different edge crossing here, uh, which simply comes from the fact that the given graph is not planar then. There is actually also no, I think, no incentive for really uh, creating um, a cognitive map which is you know, almost planar, then I think this is more a kind of a side benefit. I think another uh, issue is really important. If you now pick any start node, say this one here, right, and somebody gives me a goal node uh, like this one here, then, right, um, then there's actually a very prin nice principle now how you can 
you know, make the first step towards this goal over here then, because you can think you have now two different possible actions from this you know, state or node, and you pick the one which directs, which is now mostly goes into the direction of this goal then, right? And you can continue this principle along this way, right? Now here again, you can then uh, choose among no, no, four different actions. You just choose one which goes, no, um, well actually, yeah, so it's not, not completely true. Then here you, yeah, right now, if this is the goal and you would choose this one, you actually do find a short path over here then, yeah. Um, but this is in, in, in the, the main kind of, no, um, expected benefit of this type of congregative map um, that there's a sense of direction even in a situation where there is no direction then, right? Now this is a high dimensional space then, it's a not planar graph then, but one could apply similar principle as if one would navigate in 2D. So this now is now very fuzzy now this moving into the right direction but now there is a if one looks at it what you mathematically amounts to is simply the following you're given in current state no q of the current observation ot you're supposed to get the target observation o star then and now when you wonder how good would it be to take action in order to reach this uh, goal state you it's good not to compute the cosine or the dot product, which simply evaluates to what extent the embedding of this action moves into the right direction then. And by the way, now one can view this you know, difference vector here as something which people in cognitive science uh, refer to then as a part of an egocentric representation uh, of you know, states or item then, uh, because you sub take the difference between the goal and your current state then. And so this dot product now we uh, refer to as utility of this particular action for reaching now this target observation or star from this uh, particular uh, starting point then. And this is somewhat now conceptually analogous to the notion of a value but it has now an important difference because, as we have learned now already yesterday, um, value typically is only defined if you have already committed to a policy uh, on which you commit then after the first action. And this also typically means you have already, you have been committed to a particular reward policy or goal then, right? So whereas this year now is completely independent of any goal, uh, this notion of utility is independent. Uh, in principle, you can recompute it for any given goal um, in parallel or kind of not just whenever you need it then. Uh, and there is no uh, kind of no commitment to any policy then. So if one looks into technicalities actually, uh, before one now chooses now this action where this dot product is the highest, you also want to check uh, which action can actually be technically carried out in the current state then, right? Or maybe give it a certain value, how difficult it is to carry out this uh, action in the current state. Now, this is something now which is related to the notion of affordances. Um, and so therefore, technically, you, you multiply then this utility with an affordance value, which is computed now by some other model then, or is, you can look it up then before you then take you know, that action for which this dot product is the largest one. So now let's you know, look at an example where we see this at work, you know, still for the same graph then. So this here is a starting a node, you know, this uh, black ball, and so the star is the goal node. And we have plotted here for every possible action, uh, for every edge then, what is the utility of using this edge no, for this current no task then. So one sees it's really readily available even for kind of edges which we don't even consider at the moment. No. Um, so here you know, the, the redder color no, kind of indicates no, higher utility and then you can, um, one sees already that no, kind of the shortest path to the goal has the most reddish no, color then. And you can iteratively just you know, actually produce you know, in this, according to this principle, uh, to you know, the 
the first step, then you are here, and then you can recompute utilities if you want to, and then no here, and then the last step is only one option then. Um, yeah, I mentioned already you know, that this analogy between utilities and value function, but I think there's an important new facet you know, concerning this flexibility and generality of this notion of utility. Um, so here, you know, I said in the beginning you know, that this approach requires only very simple local plasticity rule, uh, no deep learning or anything like this is needed. Um, and the goal of learning is to learn here these two embeddings. So here, you know, somehow you're given you know, these observations from the outside in some raw form. Uh, also, you know, all actions are represented. And each of them is embedded into a common high dimensional space by these two matrices Q and V then. So if one looks at you know, the particular learning rule, you know, so we want to kind of minimize the difference between here the predicted next state on the right-hand side and the actual next state then. Um, so if we take simply gradient descent, now we arrive at these types of plasticity rules, uh, which are now kind of you know, common form already in old time, artificial networks, one called them delta rules. They're actually continuous kind of extensions of the passive prone learning rules, so almost the simplest rule one can think about. But I think they actually also of a somewhat modern nature, also in the light of the talk by Christine Greenberger today, because they have this um, structure that you have a presynaptic activity and you multiply it with a gating signal, which is not postsynaptic spikes or the time of postsynaptic spikes, but presynaptic times a gating signal then. And in this case, the gating signal is simply the prediction error then, uh, which currently occurs then. And so then, if one wants to think now about the lowest level of mana, how to implement this in brain-like you know, tissues, uh, in principle, you know, dopamine is you now has been shown to, in recent you now work, also to really be related to generative prediction errors, even in the complete absence of rewards. So you may have seen this science paper from the Nambudiri lab, you now Science 2022 where they showed actually they compared you know, kind of what the prediction error theory of dopamine would you know, suggest you know, for experimental measurements and what their alternative you know, theory suggests in all 16 cases. You know, of course, you know, uh, the reward prediction error interpretation lost then, right? So I think the main message is then both from this and also more from more recent you know, preprint from the Schönbau lab at, at NIH is that they found that dopamine is emitted for generic prediction errors also. Maybe also, it's, it's also you know, emitted for reward prediction errors, but I think this is only kind of low dimensional projection of this kind of you know, dopamine systems. But you know, the other interpretation of this is, as I indicated, you, know, you could think of you know, plateaus uh, in terms of, you know, like similar to PTSP, but recent also, no, there's work forthcoming that in also an area we won, you have a similar BTSP-like plasticity rule, but also disinhibition of s uh, simply apical dendrites is another candidate for implementing this on a low level. So this is no biological speculation, but if one looks at it you know, from the perspective of implement implementing this in any device, you know, these are of course as simple rules as you can think of. And we actually know uh, currently Yukon is in the process of implementing this on Louis 2, which is now one of these neuromorphic chips from Intel. Um, and so this is, appears to be one of the few kind of learning approaches which is so simple that they can be realized through on-chip learning on this neuromorphic hardware. So altogether now, you may wonder now, why does this cognitive map provide this sense of direction for moving towards any given goal, then this looks a little bit like a miracle cure. Um, and I think you know, this insight comes really from thinking about properties of high dimensional vectors then. Um, and uh, so if you think about principle one, according to this you now, if this prediction learning is reasonably successful, if uh, there's a path now, which you encounter during exploration from observation O to observation O star, um, then basically, you know, th this 
target state is similar to this initial state plus the sum of action embeddings which were used on this path. So in other words, you know, after learning each kind of you know, embedding of a node contains a record of how you can reach it then. Um, and so this is in the form of this you know, adding vectors, adding random vectors in high dimensional states then where in principle no any two random vectors, no, if an action is not used on this path, you know, the dot product between this and the action embedding VA is close to zero, otherwise it's significant because you know, VA is part of this sum actually. Um, and so here you no know, one sees here just we check then that you no know, also after learning most action embeddings. So in this case we had about you no know, ninety actions. Now this was from this random graph I showed. And you know, except for close to the diagonal, we see most of these um, action embeddings are actually you know, mutually almost orthogonal then. So this seems to um, be you know, what this method then implements then. So the question is how well does this planning method work? You know, it's a very simple online planning method. And we didn't find actually in algorithm books or in iBooks powerful general tools for this online planning but there are plenty of uh, methods for offline learning like the Dijkstra algorithm or A star, which I then used in AI then. Um, and if one compares then the performance you know, for this particular kind of graphs, then you know, several of them and many of them. So it, you know, average you know, Dijkstra needs 3.4 different steps you know, to move from a given star to a given goal and this uh, CML approach you know, needs a few percent more than on average then. So it becomes you know, surprisingly close to these offline methods, although algorithmically these are only two different you know, animals, right? You now the Dijkstra algorithm gets the whole graph structure uh, given at the beginning then, right? Whereas here the CML doesn't get anything, it has to explore the graph and itself you know, kind of recreate its own structure then. And one can also apply this, you know, where, where this is in forthcoming work, you now also for weighted graphs, also for stochastic graphs, where an action has an uncertain outcome, yet move you, could take you here or there then. So how, how am I doing on time? I think it's about... Uh, okay, so then, yeah, let's now move quickly through this then. So in principle, navigation is you now in rodents, you now most studied in 2D. Uh, one can also you now apply this here then. Um, the main point is here that um, if we apply this approach to 2D you know, navigation tasks, then you can then use location independent action codes or vectors then. And this has the advantage that you can generalize also to action um, and pairs which you have never seen then. So here on the left, we kind of now we sketch drawing exploration which part of this maze were already explored then. If you then given a planning task, move from here to there, you know, this uh, learned cognitive map has no problem of using then actions, although it, were never, it had never encountered these actions not during uh, exploration. So there's something a bit more sophisticated, which I cannot discuss here then because of you know, pressure of time then. Um, I think you know, this type of you know, geometric kind of planning you know, is likely to encounter problems if you say, well, I have to move from here to this, uh, r r this black dot to this yellow circle there, and there is a non-convex obstacle in between there because if you just move straight to it, you're likely to get stuck then. But on the other hand, you know, we have seen in this you know, first paradigm abstract graphs, there was no problem in getting stuck there, right? Because there is not even a notion of a detour in abstract graphs. So I think an, an, an important trick is here which can solve this is you simply you represent actions which are adjacent to an obstacle uh, in a way which is you know, s simply a new one hot vector or random vector for each of these actions, whereas otherwise in the free field you can use this kind of portable action encodes which allow you generalization. And then when you look at the resulting cognitive map, you no know, 2D projection looks like this, 
And we see here you now this obstacle is kind of contracted to an almost convex you know, kind of object. And so therefore, in this cognitive map, you can simply plan a graph from here, a path from here to there, in the usual way, always choosing the right direction. And this is the path you now in the real 2D world, now how it looks like then. So this seems to be um, a way of getting out of these problems then. So the very last thing I want to show then of a completely different type of and the scenario is when you want to control a kind of a complex simulated robot, in this case, you know, a quadruped with eight joints then. And also observations are here you know, much more structured. You know, these are 29 dimensional vectors before they're getting bedded then, you know, recording the states of each uh, joint and other things. And also actions are complex. You know, these are joint talks you know, sent to all uh, eight joints. And here one can again you now benefit from this nice principle. You just have to do some kind of you now. So it doesn't at the moment do this. Um, you just have to do some motor babbling then. Um, yeah, I think it doesn't show it then uh, here in this projection, and uh, without ever giving any goal. Oh, now it does it. Okay, yeah, no, so well, <laughs> a little bit slow then. Anyway. So if afterwards, now for the first time, this, uh, this subject gets a goal here, namely there's a predator and this is the, the quadruped, it has to escape it. So in some sense, the goal is always to see this predator as far as possible. And since both are moving, this kind of goal changes all the time then. And you can also apply this here, you know, here to the inverse task you know, of chasing something. So therefore, in situations where the goal changes at every moment, then this can just as well be accommodated by this type of planning approach then. So one slight remark on the kind of technical side. If one wants to see you know, the CMLs uh, as a analog to lightweight transformers, you know, there are some common aspects, particularly both you know, uh, exploit em embedding tokens into high dimensional representations to self-supervised learning and also represent relations then uh, and uh, applicable to many tasks. The main reason why this particular or no, the CML is so much simpler is because we have applied it so far only into Markovian environments. So therefore to predict the next state you never needed a sequence how to get there. You just needed the previous observation plus the action it applied. So therefore now this complex formalism now becomes much simpler. So no, so far, as I mentioned, this is just we have no one study out. I think in two months maybe we have another report. Then, so I think it, you know, we know brains don't just learn a single cognitive maps, but many of them and switch between them. Uh, so this is something now which is needed then. Um, and then also we know, that depending on the behavior of of a subject, you know there are different kind of you know, even central perception is represented in different ways. So this would also you know, then amount to having different separate cognitive maps. Then so far we didn't consider hierarchical CMLs, but this is an obvious temptation because one could also use combine it, I think, with reinforcement learning, uses reinforcement learning on a top level, which then outputs a particular goal to move to. And then CMLs are very good to instantly move towards a given goal then, even if they have never counted this goal so far. So the summary is you now that we see that you know, this method of learning cognitive maps appears to provide uh, a brain-inspired alternative to reinforcement learning. Uh, we are very you know, interested in discussing with you, learning from you, what are the pros and cons then. Um, and then also I think from the technical side, we see here benefits of working in high dimensional vector spaces and you know, Obviously, brains operate in this way because there are many neurons. There's a lot of wonderful work for many decades on vector symbolic architectures, but almost always uh, these uh, state vectors were constructed by clever humans, then, whereas we work now in a setting where they emerge from learning then from synaptic plasticity. There's also no cognitive scientists may also know, you know there's a concept of a cognitive graph which is you know, somewhat general than a cognitive map. You can have wormholes which port, teleport you somewhere else. So this is also something related to these ideas then. 
And altogether, no, I'm very happy to see that even once they implement reinforcement learning methods in kind of energy efficient neuromorphic hardware, one usually have problems with reinforcement learning, but this seems to be so shallow and you know, simple you know, that this uh, can be done then. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got, we've got a couple of minutes for um, questions. Thank you for a great talk. Thank you very much for your great talk. Um, I have a simple question. Uh, you showed, uh, I'm here, uh, you showed a uh, uh, comparison between uh, the number of, the average number of hops to get to the goal uh, from the CML and you compared it with uh, uh, Dicastro's algorithm. I wanted to know, um, can you compare the complexity of your algorithm in comparison to Dicastro? And I'm not even sure if this question is well posed because you have to train this embedding, and I think you do that through different epochs. So I would like to know um, how can possibly we compare these two algorithms. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, as you know, no Dijkstra typically you know they are nested loops. Then right, it builds a somewhat complex data structure implicitly, kind of you no know, goes through all possible uh, directions. So this is now a very shallow approach, which is you now kind of how we would you know navigate into DV, some are thinking no, we want to go there, and this looks go like a good direction then. And actually, you know, just in computation sense, you can then, when you're given a difference vector of a target state and the current state, you can then, through one um, multiplication of this vector with a matrix, then uh, simply estimate the value, or the utility rather, for each possible action, and then apply a winner-take-all mechanism. So it's very friendly to memoristic technology, which where you can do this type of operation in one time step, then where the uh, memorista values hold then in this case the weights or the coefficients for this embedding of these uh, actions then. I th yeah, I think you had a second part. I'm not sure whether I caught this then. The, yeah. Hey, good talk. Um, question, um, how many um, environments or domains that a natural learning system uh, is in do you think have this um, effective action that's independent of state like you have? Uh, and with that, do you have any plans on incorporating state-dependent action effects? Uh, yeah, so I think no, the, as far as I know, kind of from rodents there, very few tests. Bushake has a paper where you know, the rats had to jump at a certain point and they found you know, this had a separate different representation just from moving forward on a track then. So this is here a kind of you know, the hypothesis is for each non-standard uh, action like you know, grabbing something, you no know, jumping or turning around or so, there is probably a separate internal action code used then by the brain then. Whereas whenever you know, kind of the impacts of action are translation invariant or in some other way state invariant, then the brain kind of is in a sense better off to use a kind of the same vector to represent each action in this high dimension space then. Apparently, no, we know very little and in this data from humans, now I never saw data then actually on how this kind of operations uh, were kind of, you know, Shown up, shown up in fMRI then, but I think this is what su this approach suggests then um, to, that you also see in a sense you know, that they're probably orthogonal different action representations uh, if they have nothing to do with each other then. Hi, so um, thanks, thanks very much. So the, if I understood you well, you're mostly interested in uh, sort of like a very adequate uh, spaces that allow very simple planning algorithms to work. 
Um, but uh, so in, in cognitive science, where people have been studying like uh, um, hierarchical planning problems, like towers of annoying or something like this, and that 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 that, that doesn't uh, seem seem uh, feasible that you can actually solve it with such a simple planning algorithm. So my question is like, would it is in cases where the planning uh, the planning problem is sort of fundamentally uh, more complex than what you're discussing here? Could the, um, the the space uh, the, 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 or the, the, the cognitive space uh, approach still be applicable? No. Like, could it be that you can somehow find a slightly more complex planning algorithm that works on a sort of a slightly more sophisticated uh, space mm -hmm. and then actually solves these more uh, complex problems as well? Yeah, this is a, a great question, and we, we are working on this, and we're looking actively for planning problems which cannot be solved in this way. So if one stays in this you know, mathematically simple domain of abstract graphs, we move to ones which had now also about up to a thousand nodes then, and it seems to still work well, you know, so that within a few percent or maybe 10 percent, you are within the performance of Dijkstra. Um, we looked actually also you now, there's a very nice review paper, 2019 from Nahum et al. then about hierarchical reinforcement learning, where they kind of showed you know, some tasks where in reinforcement learning you cannot use shallow reinforcement learning, you need hierarchical reinforcement learning. We believe you know, they can all be solved with this method that I have sketched here for this U-shaped obstacle then. So at the moment, you know, we have not seen a need for hierarchical CMLs, although I think you know, they certainly, they will come in at some point. Uh, and that it will be very nice, uh, maybe we can also discuss, you know, they have concrete challenges. And also mention in principle, you could you know, also marry an, in a hierarchical approach, you know, a high level, a reinforcement learning then with fewer states then and this uh, could be used at lower levels where you get closer to the control level then um, and uh, but as I mentioned yeah we, we wonderful come up with planning tasks which cannot be solved with this uh, 